So let's start uh, the part two of the uh, modern Japan and the US-Japan relations. Um, in this part, I'm going to discuss the Japanese relation, the relationship between US and, and Japan and how it's evolved uh, after World War II. So first, let me just discuss the implications of the Japanese uh, political system for the US-Japan relationship. The Japanese political system has been very stable, even though there were a, a, a frequent changes of the leaders, the power structure remains very stable and it was very good for Japan, US-Japan relationship because it makes it pre predictable. The change of minister wouldn't have any impact on the relationship. It is basically the uh, US-Japan relationship, which uh, paramounts the importance of the Japanese foreign policy. And also it is predictable because the Japan will remain the junior partner as long as oppositions object the constitutional change. If there is a constitutional change, Japan will be able to develop its own military capability, which means that Japan will be less dependent on the United States. So of course the United States doesn't want to hold, you know, uh, shoulder or the cost of the uh, of protecting Japan. And of course, at the end of the day, you know, it, at the Japan should protect itself. But at the same time, the United States want Japan not to be a military might like uh, during the World War II that is invading to China and attacking Pearl Harbor. So for the US point of view, it is very predictable that Japan will remain as a junior partner. And the predictability, the third predictability is that Japan's investment in defense is limited. So again, this would not make Japan, even though it has the self-defense forces, the Japan will not be the sort of a stronger Japan to rebel against the United States or fight against uh, uh, North Korea or China. And the, the, this uh, sort of a limits of the investment will make it um, predictable that the Japan's future uh, in the in, in the uh, security structure in the East, uh, East Asia. But also, as, as I said, there, there is a, a question remains for the burden sharing issue. The United States is in a dilemma that the sum of the burden needs to be shared and uh, um, the United States want, to, want Japan to spend more money on its own military, but at the same time, United States doesn't want Japan to be stronger. And also um, the US-Japan relationship is not only the military issue, but also the economic issue. Um, the Iron Triangle, as I explained in the first, uh, first part, the Iron Triangle made it difficult for the US industry to penetrate into a Japanese market because of the close connection with the politicians, the Japanese industry were heavily protected by the political system. So United States during the 1980s, when there was a trade friction, there was a huge amount of um, cars and uh, semiconductors and uh, many other things have been exported to United States and which had, uh, had destroyed the US, uh, US industry in the first phase. Um, the United States wanted to use the political power to push Japan to open up its country, uh, its market. And, um, but that was very difficult because of the Iron Triangle. So this trade friction during 1980s became as a very a big, headache uh, for the alliance manager between the US and Japan. Also, there were 
very strong bureaucratic regulation uh, uh, that protects uh, foreign investment come come into Japan. And this is largely part of the uh, Iron Triangle because the politicians want to push the uh, bureaucrats to be more protective and the bureaucrats want to protect its own interest by protecting its, uh, its industry. So um, the, this economic relationship has been in, uh, uh, in a big problem in 1980s, but gradually this has just vanished away uh, for two reasons. One is the bust of bubble, the uh, Japanese uh, collapse of the bubble economy, so that the Japanese industry itself became so weak and it's not competitive. And therefore the amount of export from Japan decreased. But the more important factor was the globalization. Because of the globalization, the Japanese political system also needs to be accommodated to the globalization of the supply chain, globalization of the uh, multinational companies. You know, um, the Japanese uh, market can no longer be closed and protective. So this has changed the whole dynamics of the economic relationship with the United States. And gradually Japanese market became open because otherwise, the Japanese industry cannot be survived without the foreign direct investment. And the Japanese market became uh, quite open and also uh, uh, because partially because of the, uh, uh, the trade system became from uh, uh, turned from a GATT, General Agreement on Tariff and Trade to the World Trade Organization. So free trade was uh, was progressed and the Japanese market will, uh, has to be open in order to accommodate with the um, uh, free trade uh, principles. And also uh, Japan became as the part of the mega free trade agreement like TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which the United States was supposed to be in it, but the uh, Trump administration as well as the Biden administration refused to join. So this uh, globalization free trade makes uh, Japanese market open so that this uh, trade friction between the United States and Japan were no longer the case in, the, uh, in this century. So the security problem um, is based on starting from this pacifist constitution. Uh, in, in the part one, we discussed about the pacifist constitution, which divides the LDP and the opposition. So what this pacifist constitution says, in preamble, it says, we, the Japanese people, desire peace for all time and are deeply conscious of the high ideal controlling human relationship and we have determined to preserve our security and existence, trusting in the justice and faith of the peace-loving people of the world. So it's very idealistic. Peace-loving people of the world will, uh, and we trust them and trust their justice and faith for the good relationship in the world. This preamble strongly resembles with the Charter of United Nations. Charter of United Nations, we the people of United Nations, blah, blah, blah. And there are peace-loving people, peace-loving nations. And you know, all these concepts have resonate uh, the, um, the uh, 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 Charter of the United Nations. So that was the sort of the uh, spirit of the, uh, of the time. And in fact, the author of the Charter of the uh, um, Charter of the United Nations and the Japanese uh, Constitution, which was established under the occupation of the Allied forces, were similar. So there are same sort of people are drafting sort of a similar um, um, 
uh, sort of sharing the similar ideal. And uh, following on the uh, preambles, we desire to occupy an honorable place in the international society, striving for the preservation of peace and the banishment of tyranny and slavery, op uh, oppression and the intolerance for all time from the earth. We recognize that all people of the world have the right to live in peace, free and free from fear and want. So again, this is the um, you know, uh, honorable place in the international society, preservation of peace. And what is interesting is this tyranny and the slavery are not the vocabulary of in Japan. Japan, of course, during the World War II and the Japanese colonial occupation of the Korean Peninsula and Taiwan, there was a, some sort of a slavery act, but we didn't have officially have the slavery system, but the slavery came into the vocabulary of the constitution because the author of the constitution comes from uh, United States, UK and other allied forces. Um, so this is the sort of a spirit of the constitution and the opposition want to protect it. The other um, uh, controversial, uh, with still uh, the dividing line of the constitution was an article nine. So what article nine says, the article nine says, aspiring sincerely to the international peace based on the justice and order, the people, Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat of, or use of force as mean to settle, settling international dispute. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potentials, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. So this is a very powerful article. It says, renounce war forever as a sovereign right of the nation. But to, to, to remind you that the threat or use of force as means of settling international dispute. So if there is an international dispute, we are not going to use forces. So like today, it, there is a territorial dispute over Senkaku Islands, but we are not going to use the forces. But if there is an attack, that is not the in settling international dispute. It's the violation of international law and there is the right for self-defense. So the concept of self-defense exists in the Article 9. This is the interpretation of Article 9. And the second paragraph says, land, sea, air forces, and as well as other war potential will be never maintained. That means we are not going to have any war, war fighting capabilities, but no, because in order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph says, we are not using the forces to, for settling international dispute. So for that reason, we are not going to have the land, sea, air forces, etc. But for the self-defense, will be able to have land, sea, and air force to protect ourselves. So the, the forces that we have is called the self-defense forces. This is purely for the self-defense purposes. And well, to some extent, it can be used for the peacekeeping operations for the sake of the international peace uh, in the preamble, but the, we can have the forces, but we cannot be used for settling international dispute. So this interpretation of Article 9 is extremely important. And the pacifist constitution faces the reality. There is a high ideal of the pacifist con constitution, but the reality was that immediately after Japan became independent in 1952, uh, uh, until 1952, there was an occupation by the Allied forces. General MacArthur was the 
uh, commander of the Allied forces to occupy Japan. This is, um, so 1952 was in the middle of Korean War. So it was the time that the East and West fighting um, as, you know, as using the, the Korean Peninsula uh, as a battlefield. So by then we, we realized that the constitution have the, uh, what con the interpretation of constitution will allow to have the self-defense forces, but we cannot have the no offensive capabilities. So which means that we cannot participate in the war which doesn't involve Japan. So Korean war is out of question, Vietnam war, et cetera, et cetera, are not for the mandate in the constitution. So we are basically not being able to contribute to the American war or the, any other war. <clears throat> However, um, from the US point of view, it is frustrating that the Japan do nothing uh, when the US soldiers are, uh, are fighting in the, in the battlefield in uh, Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq or, or uh, elsewhere. Um, but um, Japan, because of this uh, uh, interpretation of constitution, the Japanese forces were uh, not allowed to participate the war which doesn't belong to Japan. But on the other hand, the Japan expect the United States to protect Japan because Japan doesn't have the uh, attacking capabilities. We don't have no, we don't have offensive capabilities, but the deterrence means that if you shoot me, I'll shoot you. But we don't have, Japan doesn't have the shooting capabilities. So we are asking United States to be the shooters. So if someone attacks Japan, then it is United States which will retaliate to the attack. And in that way, the Japan will be protected under the alliance and, uh, and the means of the, the deterrence through the alliance. So how this uh, deterrent uh, alliance is shaped based on the US-Japan Security Pact. This security pact, because of the Japanese constitution, is a very unbalanced al alliance. The United States has a treaty obligation to defend Japan, but Japan's Supreme Court decided it would not exercise the collective defense. So which means that if United States is attacked, Japan will not exercise the collective defense, which means Japan will not uh, fight with United States if United States is attacked. So it's unfair in a way to that United States has the, uh, the only party to have an obligation to protect Japan, uh, but Japan will say, oh, that's your business. You know, it's, it's not my war. I cannot be part of it. So, but still, the US-Japan Security Pact maintained for the length of the time uh, since um, 19, 1960. Um, the reason why it uh, maintained and exercised was because of the exchange of forces and bases. So United States provide offensive capability for Japan but in return, the United States will have the, 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 the rights to use the Japan soil as the forward deployment basis. Because during the Cold War, Japan was the closest ally for uh, uh, in the Far East Russia, Far East Soviet Union. The Japan is, you know, across the Sea of Japan, there was a Vladivostok and, uh, and the and the, and the Siberia. So Japan will be the, uh, the front line of the Cold War. So the, um, having a basis in Japan 
for the United States is extremely important for the global strategy for United States. So US uh, as, a, as an exchange of having the basis in, in Japan soil, Japan will have the uh, um, uh, uh, obligation to uh, protect US bases because it's part of Japan, but at the same time, US has an obligation to protect, the, protect Japan because there are so many bases in United, uh, in Japan, the, so many US bases in Japan. So this was the sort of an exchange. And, and um, the, uh, what is interesting is that there is a, a huge concentration of the uh, US, US forces in Okinawa. In Okinawa, a large um, air base called the Futema Marine air, air Station and uh, Air Force Base called Kadena. And there are a big um, chunk of the uh, US forces stationed in Okinawa as the forward deployment. The problem is that there are so many troubles with the local people. So the local people demand to, uh, to, to move the US forces from Okinawa to the mainland Japan or to Guam or somewhere else. But the, Okinawa, the Japanese government have no choice but to accept the US uh, request to stay in Okinawa. So the, the Okinawa has been always a dilemma uh, for the Japan's relationship with United States. During the Cold War, the balance between the United States, the US-Japan relationship in terms of the uh, security was basically good because there, there was a sort of shared purposes. The problem is that when the Cold War is over, that means this is the end of the rationale for the US to have the state, to have the basis in, in Japan because there is no longer to fight against the Russians and you know, there is no reason for the United States to stay in Japan. So Japan fear being abundant and try and recognize the importance of alliance contribution. And Japan increased the host nation support, which is to support the cost of the uh, US, uh, US forces in Japan. And the host nation support will be, uh, there, there are host nation support by South Korea, Germany, Qatar, Bahrain, et cetera, et cetera. But the Japan is the most generous country for the host nation support. That is to facilitate the US forces to ma maintain their bases in Japan as the deterrence power for the Japanese under the Japanese constitution. Then the Japan came to a big challenge during the Gulf War, starting from the 1991, because the Gulf War immediately after the collapse of Soviet, well, uh, it's not the, uh, immediately after the collapse of Berlin Wall, but Soviet Union was there. It, it uh, collapsed after the uh, starting of the Gulf War. Um, <clears throat> the United States demanded Japan to join the coalition forces which are attacking the Saddam Hussein to keep them keep him out from the Kuwait. But Japan, because of the constitutional constraints, Japan only contributed financially. And this financial contribution was not appreciated by Kuwait. Kuwait has put the um, uh, 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 advertisement on the Washington Post immediately after the emancipation of Kuwait, and Japan was not listed as the particip uh, participating state in the Gulf War. Yes, of course, Japan didn't send the troops, but the Japan made a, a huge financial contribution. So Japan realized that, oh my God, if we don't contribute, then we will not be able to um, maintain the US forces in Japan, will be, um, will be neglected by the international community. So that was the sort of an understanding in Japan. And therefore, Japan tried to make it hard to balance between 
the constitution and what Japan can do to contribute to the international peace. So the answer came out as the UN peacekeeping forces. Japan can contribute to the UN peacekeeping operations. And in, in fact, there was a UN peacekeeping operation in 1992 in Cambodia. And the Akashi Yasushi, who was the, uh, head, uh, sec the special representative of the Secretary General of United Nations, so, and he's Japanese, so Japan had the whole reason to contribute to the ANTAC, the UN, uh, um, UN Transitionary Authority in Cambodia. And this was the first big success of the Japanese sending the troops out of Japan. And gradually Japan started to realize that we can do much more than just a contribution to the UN peacekeeping operations. So the new guidelines, which is the guideline for the US-Japan Security Alliance um, is established in 1992. This was the change, this was following the change of the US uh, security strategy in East Asia Pacific in uh, to 1995. And the, the US forces will be able to mobilize to anywhere on the world. So the, the Gulf regions or Afghanistan, you know, that, that, that basically the understanding that the US forces will not be, may not be stationed only in Japan, but you know, the, the Japanese, the US bases in Japan will be used as a platform for the, the, the global strategy for, for United States. So what happens if the US forces were engaged in the war, for example, in case of the Chinese invasion to Taiwan? And in fact, in 1995, there was a Taiwan Strait crisis and the President Clinton has sent the uh, um, aircraft carriers to the Taiwan Strait. So what happens if there is an engagement in Taiwan? If there is an engagement in Taiwan, then the China may attack the US, not only the US forces in Taiwan Strait, but also they are trying to attack the US bases in Japan. So we need to do something to, uh, to, to accommodate in that sort of a situation. So Japan established the emergency at periphery war a law. And uh, if there is this, a situation, which is the, the war fighting situation beyond Japanese territory, it would have an impact on the Japanese uh, Japan security then the self-defense force may operate together with the US forces. So this is a big change. It, is, it seems to be the exercise of the collective defense, which was renounced by the Supreme Court. But the, in fact, the, the logic was that Japan will escort and associate with the US forces, but not fighting together. So, I don't know, it's, it's a sort of a very complicated uh, uh, understanding, but at least Japan is doing something to show the presence in the uh, outside of Japan. And then there was the war against terror. After 9-11, uh, the United States has engaged in the war in Afghanistan and then Iraq. Japan was asked again to do something. So what Japan did, was to establish the special measure law, which is the uh, uh, one-time ad hoc uh, uh, lawmaking to support US activities. And it is not engaged into the frontline combat, but support logistics of the US, force, uh, US activities. So Japan for the Afghanistan, Japan sent the uh, ships to uh, fuel the US, um, U.S. Uh, naval uh, naval uh, vessels, and in Iraq, Japan sent the um, air self defense force aircraft to Iraq to support the the logistics of the um, of the co uh, ally, uh, coalition forces in Iraq. So 
this was basically providing the airlift capabilities. And today there is the new situation, uh, which is basically the US-China rivalry. The Japan's major threat is China and North Korea. Uh, for Japan to build up the, uh, uh, to, to, to counter the threat from North Korea, we need to develop the missile defense system and protecting Japan, uh, the entire Japan, but also it is more likely that the North Koreans will target the US forces in Japan. So protecting Japan, Jap uh, the US bases in Japan from North Korean missile is the prime importance. So missile defense system, building up the missile defense system is both for the Japan's uh, protection and the protection of the US forces. And in terms of the missile defense, Japan and the United States are uh, collectively working because the uh, early warning satellite uh, system, Japan doesn't have the satellite to detect the missile launch from uh, North Korea. So what we need is to have the sh information sharing from United States. Sharing information is not, again, the issue of the uh, collective self-defense. Um, so, <clears throat> so missile defense is the sort of an entire system uh, working uh, as a one unit. The other major issue is the Senkaku Island. Uh, and uh, every time new Japanese uh, mini prime minister came into power and the new president came into power in the United States, there's always an exchange of the recognition that Senkaku Islands is applied the Article 5 of the Security Pact, which means the United States is obliged to protect the Japan's territory. So recognition of Senkaku as a Japanese territory means important because that is deterring the Chinese invasion to Senkaku. And addition to um, the uh, what is what Japan is doing now, because of the increasing tension between the United States and China, and to some extent Japan and China, Japan has uh, has established the uh, new peace and security legislations in 2015. So this is a very small portion, but the introduction of collective defense, but it has a very strong uh, uh, condition attached to it. If a situation that would threaten the existence of Japan, the self-defense force may operate to protect US forces, which means they are working together. The emergency at periphery law only provides the Japanese capability for the logistics, but this peace and security legislation provides, allows self-defense force to fight together with the uh, US forces. So the particular uh, situation is ima imagine uh, the particular situation is Taiwan. So if there is a Taiwan uh, straight situation, then it may, uh, the self defense force may operate uh, to protect the US forces. So it is a little breakthrough from the argument of Itaika. Itaika is the US and Japan, Japanese forces work as one unit. And uh, th this is about the, uh, about the collection, uh, collective self-defense. But Japan has a long history of denying the exercise of collective defense and denying the ittaika. But uh, at the end of the day, this uh, 2015 peace and security legislation has made a breakthrough under the very strict condition, but uh, to be able to exercise the collective defense. And today, there is another side of the security which comes into play, which is called the economic security. The um, newly established Kishida cabinet has the minister for economic security. Uh, Mr. Kobayashi is now uh, as a minister for economic security. And the Quad, the Quadori Quad National uh, uh, Security Arrangement, the Quad is the uh, group of United States, Japan, Australia, and India, the four country. Um, but this Quad 
is focusing on maintaining the supply chain and to secure the uh, economic security. Economic security means that if the China is holding the key point, key items for the supply chain, then it will um, control, um, it will be the security risks. So maintaining the close network of the supply chain and economic uh, coalition uh, among the Quad countries, the like-minded friends, um, Japan, US, uh, will be able to be less dependent on China. And also the Quad is limiting the transfer of technology and um, uh, supporting the supply chain of the logistics item, uh, lo uh, strategic item uh, from China. And um, uh, security uh, secure the supply chain among the Quad uh, states and to enhance this export control regime to protect the, the economic, uh, economic and technological superiority against China. But it's not only done only by Japan or United States, but it needs to be done as Quad. So this is the situation of today. And the, I hope that uh, it is understandable. And uh, I'll be, I am looking forward to uh, discuss with you in the live chats in, uh, via Zoom. So thank you very much for listening and uh, I'll see you uh, in live uh, next time. Bye-bye.